Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I am very, very excited to tell you about the work that I've been doing for the past six years. Um, in the broadest of terms, my research is about the intelligent management of machine learning, or the intelligent control of all the parts that surround your standard machine learning pipeline. So what do I mean by that? Uh, OK, well, let's very quickly review the machine learning pipeline. Uh, so in order to do machine learning, you have to first obtain data, right? And you can get this from Reuters, New York Times, UCI Machine Learning Repository, whatever. You obtain it. And then after you obtain the data, if you're going to do supervised learning, uh, you label the data. And nowadays, crowdsourcing is a very popular method for labeling data. Then you take that labeled data, and then you train a machine learning algorithm, logistic regression, neural nets, whatever, right? And then you have your algorithm, and then you test it using a separate test or validation set. And then you tune your hyperparameters and try to make your machine learning algorithm work better. So that's the standard machine learning pipeline. Um, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. So what I mean by the management of machine learning is the execution of everything that surrounds the machine learning algorithm so that the actual algorithm can work well. Now these days, this management is largely manual and ad hoc. But imagine if an agent could intelligently take care of all these steps. Right? Imagine if there's an agent, and say it's reading the newspaper or the web, to learn more about the wor world that it's in, uh, or to track down someone that it's trying to find, and it comes across a, ver a verb that it doesn't understand. And it's never, ever seen this verb before. What if this agent were able to utilize various resources, like the crowd, to teach itself what this verb means? What if it could ask the crowd to provide examples to train its deep neural net? Uh, what if it could use the crowd to test itself in order to tune its hyperparameters? Uh, what if this agent were able to intelligently manage its own machine learning? So when I say I work on the intelligent management of machine learning, I mean instead of working on the latest architecture for LSTMs, I've tried to answer questions like, how do you intelligently obtain data? How do you intelligently label data? How do you intelligently clean up data? How do you intelligently create uh, test sets? So now that I've hopefully convinced you that uh, the intelligent management of machine learning is important, I want to give you a very broad overview of my dissertation. The first part of my dissertation looks at how to intelligently produce high quality labels. Uh, high quality labels are incredibly important for the very last part of the machine learning pipeline, uh, or when you just want things to be labeled very cleanly. So while I don't want to get, get into the details about this work, I do want to at least give you uh, a flavor of the problems that we solved here. So in my AAAI 2012 paper, we looked at how we can dynamically switch between multiple workflows to label examples with higher accuracy. Uh, so what, I'm, what do I mean by that? Suppose you're trying to do entity linking, right? So suppose you have some sentence, like Washington ate an apple pie, and you're trying to figure out whether Washington refers to the person or the state. Now, how people typically do this is they come up with multiple workflows uh, to present to the crowd, right? So for instance, one workflow to do this might be to show the crowd uh, two Wikipedia pages and ask the crowd to identify which Wikipedia page uh, tells you uh, what Washington is. Another workflow might be to show the crowd uh, freebase tags and ask the crowd to identify which freebase tag uh, corresponds to Washington. Uh, and then what people typically do with these multiple workflows is they do some sort of A-B test and figure out which workflow works the best, and then they use that and throw away the rest. But actually what we showed was this is extremely not optimal. Uh, you should actually keep around all, all your workflows. And so we uh, use the POMDP to model a, deci a decision process where basically we say, OK, well, suppose, say, you've gotten an answer uh, from worker A using workflow 1, and you've gotten another answer from worker B using workflow 2. What should you do now? Should you stop? Are you confident in your answer? Or should you ask another worker using some other workflow to give you another label? In my UAI 2012 paper, we looked at how you can make decisions about redundant uh, labeling when you don't have a finite set of possible answers. I'm really sorry to interrupt you so early, but the, the previous slide uh, work was so fascinating. The thing I'm curious about is, so what are the, the differences you observe? You said extremely suboptimal. Is this like a factor of two, a factor of 10 relative to simple baseline? Uh, so I, I don't know the number off the top of my head. 
Uh, but what we did compare it to was basically we chose the best performing workflow, and we used the POMDP to make decisions in that workflow. And then we compared that against switching between the workflows, and we saw you know, reduction in cost and increase in quality. Um, I, I, order of magnitude, is it 10 percent, 100 percent, 1,000 percent? I'm throwing out a number here, 50 percent. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but I'll get back to you on that. So uh, in my UAI 2012 paper, we looked at how we can make decisions about redundant labeling when you don't have the finite set of possible answers. And so this is a case when, say, you have a task, like you're asking workers to tell you how many people are in this image, or some SAT math problem, for instance. Um, you don't know. You can't give them a multiple choice question here, right? because there's an infinite set of possible answers. Um, so what do you do? Uh, well, the problem with this is, well, typically when you have a finite set of answers, you can place a distribution over that. right? Um, and then you can do some sort of posterior updating. Uh, but you can't do that here, so what do you do? Uh, well, so we used the Chinese restaurant process, which is a stochastic process, which allows you to actually model this. Um, basically what we said was, okay, now we're going to model the probability that a worker gives you a label that you've actually never seen before. And so that lets you collapse sort of infinity into uh, one chunk. And yes? You could use a continuous distribution, but then how would you set the prior? It seems pretty arbitrary. If you pick a random distribution, it seems like an arbitrary distribution to set over that uh, range, right? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I see your point. If you could, maybe you could use um, image late, some sort of machine vision to say, oh, that's you know, about 100, so let's put a Gaussian over 100, right? Um, sure, maybe. But uh, I, I think our solution is more general. Um, and so we again did some decision theory here, um, where basically we said, okay, this some set of workers has given you some set of labels. What should you ne do next? Are you confident, or should you get another label? All right, so that was the first part of my dissertation. The second part of my dissertation looks at the data labeling part of the machine learning pipeline, um, and in particular looks at the trade offs uh, in constructing training sets. And the interesting thing about training sets is that unlike test sets, uh, you can have noise in your training set. It's perfectly OK. Um, and this is the work that I'm going to be talking about in depth today, so I'll return to this later. Finally, the third part of my dissertation looks at the very beginning of the machine learning pipeline, example acquisition, uh, which has been fairly neglected in, in the literature so far. Um, in particular, it looks at how you can learn completely novel concepts. So this is research that I'm working on currently, and I'll touch on this at the end of the talk. All right, so outside of my dissertation, dissertation proper, I also went on some side explorations during my two internships at MSR. In a AAA 2014 paper, we looked at how to integrate implicit signals uh, in a recommendation system for crowdsourcing. So this is you have a set of workers, you have a set of tasks. How do you recommend tasks to workers so that they're most productive or most happy? Um, in an Ishikai 2015 paper, we looked at the problem of meta-reasoning. Uh, which incidentally can also be considered under, under the umbrella of intelligent management of machine learning. Uh, so for those who don't know, meta-reasoning is this funny problem, which is, okay, you have some robot, and this robot is trying to save a drowning person. Um, and so this robot is planning about how to save this drowning person. But the problem is, while the robot is planning, the drowning person is still drowning. And so you clearly uh, can't just continue to plan because the person will, might just drown. And so you have to make this decision about whether you should stop planning or continue planning, or what do you do to optimally save this drowning person? OK, so that was a very broad overview of my dissertation, plus some extras. I now want to spend the remainder of this talk uh, discussing the second part of my dissertation in depth, uh, which is about the noise and diversity trade-offs that you can make when you're constructing training sets. And we're go I I'm going to first discuss the work that we published in HCOM 2014. So there are three universal certainties in life, death, taxes, and crowd worker mistakes. Workers will label training data incorrectly, right? No matter what you do, they're always going to do it. 
So when people crowdsource their training data, what do they typically, typically do? They ask multiple workers, right? And so they ask multiple workers for labels, and then they use some sort of aggregation method, like majority vote or expectation maximization, uh, to figure out what the correct label is given the multiple noisy ones, right? Um, and there's been tons and tons of work using very complicated math and statistics about how you can take noisy labels and aggregate them to figure out what the gold label is. Now, all this work is great, but it makes a very key assumption, and that assumption is that relabeling is necessary. And indeed, if you're trying to maximize data quality, yes, relabeling absolutely is necessary. But if you're just trying to train a machine learning algorithm, then actually, noise is perfectly OK. right? You can give a bunch of noisy data to a machine learning algorithm, and it might just work perfectly fine. Well, no noise is OK up to a point. So there is a trade-off here. Uh, and this is the trade-off that I'm, that I'm basically going to be talking about for the rest of the talk. And that trade-off is the following. Suppose you have a fixed budget. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have more noisy data, or would you rather have less better data? I do want to note that we're not the first to have noticed this trade-off. Uh, Sheng et al. discovered this trade-off in 2008, uh, but we really are the first to really provide solutions to it. So just to be a little bit more concrete about what I mean uh, about this trade-off, suppose you have a budget of nine, and everything, all your examples and labels have unit cost, and suppose your workers are 75% accurate. Which of the following strategies would be best? Should you unilabel? That is, should you ask each of your workers to label each example once, so you get nine examples with labels that are 75% accurate? Or should you have three workers label every example, so that you'll have three examples with labels that are 85% accurate? Or should you do the extreme, and should you get all nine of your workers to label a single example, so that you'll have one example with a label that's 99% accurate and train your machine learning algorithm with that. So this is clearly the wrong thing to do, uh, but what we really wanted to understand is how do you make these sort of decisions, right? Um, and so the first thing we did is uh, we took 12 data sets from the UCI machine le learning repository, and we tried these strategies. We, we tried unilabeling, we tried relabeling strategies to see what would happen. We trained logistic regression classifiers. Uh, we simulated 55% accurate workers. So these are workers that are barely better than random. Uh, and then we fixed the budget using half of the available examples. Um, and, and as I said, we tried unilabeling, we tried relabeling, and this is what we found. We found that unilabeling is better in over half the data sets. And so this is with workers that are barely better than random. Right? And this is super surprising, right? Everybody does relabeling. How, how could it be possible that if you just ask these horrible workers to give you one label per example, that does better than relabeling strategies? Um, and so after thinking about this really, really hard, we came up with three factors that affect relabeling efficacy. And these three factors are the inductive bias of a learning algorithm, the worker accuracy, and the budget. And so. Uh, yes, everyth everything depends on. Sorry, I didn't actually go through this graph because it was just for show. Um, but basically, what this says is in these uh, data sets, unilabeling is doing better, and in these data sets, relabeling is doing better for a fixed learning algorithm. This is for logistic regression. Correct. I'll, I'll go into that. Okay. Right, so I, I'm going to go through each of these three factors uh, and tell you about how they might affect relabeling. Um, but first of all, I want to make clear uh, what the assumptions we're making are. Uh, so we're going to be doing uniformly random sampling, which means that we're doing passive learning. Uh, we're not going to be intelligently picking which examples to label. We're doing binary classification tasks. All our workers will be identical. Uh, they all have the same accuracy. Uh, we're going to have constant cost, so everything, all the labels uh, cost the same. And then we're also going to use JK relabeling, which is sort of a generalization of majority vote that is slightly smarter. So what is that? OK, well, JK relabeling basically says, suppose you are, say, using majority vote uh, with three people. If the first two both tell you the same label, then you should actually stop. You shouldn't ask a third worker. All right, so 2-3 relabeling says, uh, Get three labels, unless the first two are the same. Three-five relabeling says get five labels and stop when you get three of a certain class.
class. OK, so that's the problem setting. And now I want to tell you about how inductive bias of a classifier would affect the power of relabeling. Yes? So are these all binary classification tests? Yes. All right, so let's quickly review what inductive bias is. Strong inductive bias means that your learning algorithm is making strong assumptions, which means that it has low expressiveness. So this is something like a linear classifier, like logistic regression. Weak inductive bias means that your learning algorithm is making weak assumptions, which means it has very high expressiveness, which means it can learn basically anything you throw at it. And this is something like a decision tree. All right, so here's some intuition about why inductive bias affects relabeling. Suppose you're trying to learn this toy problem where everybody 65 and older is a senior citizen. And now we throw in some noise. All right, what happens if you try to learn a strong inductive bias classifier? Well, if you try to learn a strong inductive bias classifier, like a linear classifier, it'll basically get the decision boundary about right because of its low expressiveness. The noise doesn't really affect it. But if you try to learn a weak inductive bias classifier, like a decision tree, which has very high expressiveness, which can basically learn any concept that you want it to learn, it's basically going to go and learn all the noise and overfit. Right? And so what this tells us is that relabeling should be more useful when inductive bias is weaker, because you want to make sure that your data is clean given an algorithm that's very expressive. Right, so regularization is a way to change the inductive bias of a classifier. But I mean, it's still, a decision tree can still classify anything you want, even with regularization. It's just biased towards a specific um, No, so regular, it, with regularization, right, you can say if you're changing the depth of a decision tree, um, if you restrict it from. Okay, so you're talking about like a hard kind of. Yeah. Right, so that was the intuition. And now I want to show you a bunch of simulated, simulated experiments. Um, it's hard to control for only one factor on real data sets, so we'll look at these first. And then we'll go back to the real data sets at the end. Uh, so we're going to be working with two Gaussian clusters in our data. Uh, we're going to be using a budget of 500, and we're going to simulate workers with 75% accuracy. And we're going to randomly pick means and covariances. Um, and every experiment is going to be averaged over 1,000 random data sets. Now, there are three different ways that we're going to look at that we can use to control inductive bias. And that's through the number of features, the type of classifier, and regularization. So number of features controls the inductive bias, because if you're using a linear classifier, as you increase the number of features, you're increasing the VC dimension. All right, so here's a graph. On the x-axis, you see the number of features. Um, and on the y-axis, you see relabeling accuracy divided by unit labeling accuracy. So what that means is if you are below the x-axis, unit labeling is doing better. And if you are above the x-axis, relabeling is doing better. And as you can see, as you weaken the inductive bias, the relabeling becomes more powerful. So Chris, uh, le uh, let me suggest a different interpretation of this graph and tell me why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the, the notion of bias, I think, is a little bit more nuanced because uh, it also has to do, in this particular case, say, with the relation between the number of features you have in your data and the number of features that you need to characterize. So the number of features you have in your model and the number of features you need to characterize the data, also the relevance, the relationship between them. So it's not like um, this would hold uh, for, for any data set. It, it, it's, it's more nuanced. Uh, let's, let's not get into a disagreement with that, because that's not my point. Uh, I, I'm, my, my point is that this graph could vary. So when I look at this graph, my conclusion is I should definitely do relabeling always. Why? Because in the cases where it doesn't help, it only hurts by a little bit. And in the cases where it does help, it helps by quite a bit. And I don't really know for any given data set without extensive experimentation where I'm at. And so if I'm using this kind of thing, I should do relabeling. I think what you say is fair. Um, I think what we're just trying to show is a trend that is as you increase the number of features, you're increasing the VC dimension, you're weakening the inductive bias, it makes relabeling more powerful. It doesn't necessarily mean you should always use relabeling. For this particular data set, yes, it does. 
But the trend is that relabeling becomes more powerful as the inductive bias becomes weaker. Right. And that's just and, what and we're I trying guess to the, show. The point that I'm trying to make, and, and maybe it's already factored in in your experiment because you mentioned decision theoretic, is that you have to not just account for the plus and minus, but for the magnitude of the difference. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch what you oh, were. What I was trying to say is when you're making the decision in practice, yes. should you do relabeling or not, mm -hmm. you should also consider not just the likelihood that one is better than the other, but also the magnitude of yes. the difference. Yes, I, I agree. Okay. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. But uh, Right, so all we're, all we're trying to show here is a trend. Um, yes? Right, so when you're using a linear classifier, it's actually, there's this property that you're basically increase the VC, you're increasing the VC dimension of uh, the algorithm as you increase the number of features uh, in, in the data set. Uh, the algorithm is fixed here, uh, so let's probably should get into this. <laughs> right, um, and so here are three, uh, two more lines here, which basically show as you do even more relabeling, um, relabeling becomes more powerful uh, as you increase the number of features. Um, so that was changing the number of features. Now we're going to change the classifier. Right, different classifiers have different expressiveness capabilities. Um, we're going to fix the number of features to be 50. And if you look at the left, you'll see that uh, with support vector machines and with logistic re regression, which are strong inductive bias classifiers, unilabeling does better. But with random forest, decision trees, and nearest neighbors, uh, these classifiers have weaker inductive bias, and relabeling does better here. And basically, we see the same pattern. Um, and then finally, uh, we want to change the regularization, see how that affects things. So now we're going to look at a decision tree and we're going to change the maximum depth of the decision tree. So as you increase the maximum depth of a decision tree, you're weakening the inductive bias uh, and relabeling becomes more powerful. And so these trends basically uh, hold through where weaker inductive bias uh, means relabeling becomes more useful. So next I want to talk about uh, worker accuracy and how worker accuracy might affect relabeling. So intuitively, relabeling should do best when the workers are not very good, right? Um, and unilabeling should do the best when workers are perfect, right? If you have perfect workers, then you shouldn't do any kind of relabeling. Um, but the story is just a slightly a bit more complicated than that. So here's a graph, and what this graph is showing is suppose you have some workers and they are perfect, if you do 2-3 relabeling using perfect workers, the accuracy gain you have from the aggregated label uh, is very little. Whereas if your workers are 75% accurate, and then you do 2-3 relabeling with those workers, the accuracy gain in your aggregated label is very high. And then at the very far left of this graph, if you have almost random workers, uh, and you do 2-3 relabeling with these workers, then the accuracy gain again for that label is actually very small. Now, uh, this is prior work. This basically shows you that when the workers are moderately accurate, the accuracy gain you get in your aggregated label from doing majority vote is highest when the, when the workers are moderate. Um, but what we actually want to show is does this hold through to when you're actually training a machine learning algorithm, not just on the quality of the labels themselves. So we ran an experiment. Uh, where we have, again, a data set with 50 features, a uh, budget of 500. Uh, we're training a decision tree. And what you see here is we're varying worker accuracy on the x-axis. And at the ends, uh, you see relabeling is not as powerful as when relabeling, uh, as when workers are moderately accurate. And so relabeling is more effective when workers are moderately accurate. So that's the same conclusion as from your previous work? Yes, it's the same conclusion. And finally, I want to talk about how budget affects relabeling. Um, so budget is also a little bit counterintuitive. You might think uh, that relabeling should become more powerful as you increase 
the budget, right? Because if you have an infinite budget, then you would want to go and relabel everything infinitely many times. Um, but that's not true. So consider this example. Suppose you have some low budget, and you have perfect labels, and this is your correct separator. Now, suppose you have noisy labels. If you have noisy labels, then you're just going to totally do something completely wrong, right? Um, noise is really bad when you don't have very many examples, and bad labels are, at the beginning are basically really, really bad. Um, but what happens if you have a high budget? Well, if you have a high budget, then noise just becomes noise, right? Um, getting more examples becomes a form of relabeling, essentially. Um, you can get a lot of d data points that are close to each other, and basically the learner can go and ignore all the noise that is in the data set. And so what this intuition shows us is that when you have a very high budget, unilabeling should become more useful. And so here is another graph where now we're varying the budget on the x-axis. Um, the y-axis has changed here. Uh, basically, we're showing just the classifier accuracy, the test accuracy. Um, and what you see is when the budget is small, unilabeling is not good. But as you increase the budget all the way to 10,000, uni unilabeling eventually starts beating out the relabeling strategies. And this was with a decision tree uh, with 75% accurate workers. So unilabeling beats relabeling with higher budgets. All right, so those are all simulated data sets. Now we want to go back to the real data sets and see if the patterns that we found there sort of hold through to the real data sets from the ECI machine learning, machine learning repository. So this is the same, the same graph that I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. Um, but now I'm going to show you actually that everything to the left of the line in the middle has less than 100 features. And everything to the right of, of that line has greater than 100 features. Um, so we see that the data sets where there is stronger inductive bias, uh, unilabeling does better. And with the data sets that have weaker inductive bias, uh, relabeling does better. Um, and we're still simulating 55% accurate workers here. So what happens if we make the workers moderately accurate? Well, you might expect that relabeling becomes more powerful. And it does. Is this average of a whole bunch of data sets? Each one of these is a data set. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So just, to, just to Alan's point, it's, it's slightly surprising because it depends the number of features you have in your data sets. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't necessarily correlate with how easy or difficult the learning problem is. Yes, I agree. Um, it, it's just one factor, and we're basically trying to find patterns here. Um, and so there, are, there will always be exceptions, right? You can even go back to one of my graphs, and you'll see that there was one particular point which didn't make sense if you were paying attention. Um, but I think those are just experimental kinks, right? Um, so. Uh, I just went over the three factors that we were looking at that affect relabeling efficacy. We found that relabeling is more useful when inductive bias is weaker. Uh, we found that relabeling is more useful when workers are moderately, moderately accurate. And we found that relabeling is more useful when budgets are small. All right, so that was my HCOMP work, where we looked at the different properties that affect the noise and size trade-offs in training sets. Yes? Right, right, right. So, so all the work that I just talk, talked about didn't tell you anything about making decisions. It was just trying to find patterns. Um, but in my next piece of work, we do try to make decisions. Um, and so uh, that was a very nice segue. Uh, now I'm going to talk about my AI, AAAI 2016 work, where we basically generalize active learning to allow for relabeling. Uh, so you can make these decisions uh, dynamically. And we call this new setting reactive learning. All right, so to quickly review active learning, um, what does active learning do? Active learning says, all right, you have a current labeled training set. You have an unlabeled set. Uh, and you have your current classifier. And now you have to make a decision, which is which new example should I get, another label, get a label for to add to my training set? 
Um, and then now we're, we're, go we're going to generalize this to something called reactive learning, where now the decision becomes, should I relabel? Should I get a label for uh, an example that I've already seen? Or should I get a new label for a new example that I've never seen before? And so here are the contributions that we've made with respect to reactive learning. Uh, so first we show that standard active learning algorithms fail, in, partic in particular uh, uncertainty sampling and expected error reduction, which are both popular active learning algorithms. They both uh, perform extremely poorly on the new reactive learning setting. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, new reactive learning algorithms that we came up with, uh, in particular extensions of uncertainty sampling and a completely new algorithm called impact sampling. Um, and then I'm going to show that, surprisingly, impact sampling is actually, in some ways, a generalization of uncertainty sampling. So why do standard active learning algorithms fail? Well, suppose that you are trying to learn this, again, toy example of diamonds and circles, and you have this H star is your best hypothesis here. So you're trying to learn a 1D threshold. And suppose that uh, H is your current hypothesis. So what would uncertainty sampling do? So uncertainty sampling says, let's label the examples that the classifier is currently most uncertain about. OK, so in this case, uncertainty sampling would label the, the examples right next to the uh, decision boundary. Now, for inductive purposes, suppose that you've already labeled these uh, examples many, many times already. Now, because they've already been labeled many, many times, they've already basically converged to a label. And so uncertainty sampling is going to say, OK, well, let's get another label for these examples. But when it receives another label for these examples, it's just going to not do anything. The label won't change the aggregated label. And so the training set doesn't change. And if your training set doesn't change, your classifier doesn't change. And if your classifier doesn't change, then nothing happens, and you get into this infinite loop where basically you just relabel the same examples over and over and learn nothing. And so uncertainty sampling fails because it'll label these two examples infinitely many times. So what is the fundamental problem? The fundamental problem here is that uncertainty sampling doesn't consider label uncertainty. right? And it considers the uncertainty of the classifier, but it doesn't consider the information that you have uh, that, that you got from the labels themselves. Uh, so that's why uncertainty sampling fails. Uh, expected error reduction also fails for almost the exact same reason. Um, and I won't get into the details here, but you're free to ask me later. OK, so now that we know why standard active learning algorithms fail, uh, I'm going to go into how we can extend uncertainty sampling uh, in order to fix the problems. So how do you fix the problems? Well, why don't you just consider the aggregate label uncertainty, right? Instead of just considering the, the uncertainty in the classifier, consider the uncertainty in the labels that you're getting. Um, and so in this same example, if you have an example with high, num high number of annotations, then that example actually has low uncertainty. You're very certain about what that label is. And if you have uh, an example with a low number of annotations, then that actually has high uncertainty. Right? You're actually not certain at all about what that label is. And then what you can do is do some sort of weighting. Right? You can just weight the classifier uncertainty against the label uncertainty and use that as your metric of uncertainty for uncertainty sampling. Another thing you might be able to do is just do some sort of fixed relabeling. Right? So you can pick uh, new unlabeled examples using the uncertainty sampling, and then just get a fixed number of labels for that example. So never go beyond a certain number. Now, these two algorithms fix the infinite looping problems, but the problem with these two algorithms is that now, well, now you have to pick hyperparameters here. right? So that, that's difficult. So now I'm going to tell you about a new algorithm that uh, we, we came up with that not only elegantly fixes the infinite looping problems, it also doesn't have this hyperparameter choosing. And that algorithm is impact sampling. So how does impact sampling work? OK, so impact sampling says, we're going to pick the example that, if labeled, will impact the classifier the most. So a point that's labeled many, many times will be unlikely to change the classifier, so we'll be unlikely to pick that example. And we're going to use psi to denote impact. 
So here's some intuition about uh, impact sampling. So suppose again that we're trying to learn a 1D threshold, um, and H is your current hypothesis, and you currently have the endpoints labeled. How does impact sampling work? Suppose uh, we're going to try to compute the expected impact of labeling this example. So what is the expected impact of labeling this example? Well, the expected impact is going to be the impact of labeling this example a diamond. So what happens if you label this example a diamond? Your hypothesis is going to move over six examples, and six predictions are going to flip. So we'll just say that the impact here is six. Now we have to consider the impact of labeling this example a circle. If you label this example a circle, uh, the hypothesis is going to shift over to the left five examples, so five predictions are going to flip. And so we'll consider uh, the impact of this to be five. OK, well, now you know the impact of labeling a, the example as a diamond and the impact of labeling the example as a circle. Now you can compute an expectation. Right? And how do you compute that expectation? Uh, well, you can compute the probability that you receive a label by using the classifier's belief as a prior and then using a Bayesian up update using the annotations that you actually have from your workers. And so now uh, we can check to see if this algorithm actually does fix the problems that we had with uncertainty sampling. So if you assume that the labels uh, are better than random, the workers are better than random, as the number of labels goes to infinity, you can see that the impact of an example goes to zero. And so examples with more labels are less likely to be lab labeled again. Now, ostensibly, uncertainty sampling and impact sampling are doing two completely things. They're, uh, uh, they're optimizing for two completely different objectives, right? Uncertainty sampling says, let's pick the example that we're most uncertain about. Impact sampling says, let's pick the example that causes the most impact. Uh, but what we found was that in many noiseless settings, when relabeling is unnecessary, Impact sampling actually does the exact same thing as uncertainty sampling. The key difference is that when relabeling is necessary, impact sampling uh, does something different than uncertainty sampling. And so this sort of shows that impact sampling is in some ways a generalization of uncertainty sampling from the active learning setting to the reactive learning setting. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might have noticed that impact sampling is myopic. Um, in that it doesn't really do any sort of look ahead. And so what I mean by that is, okay, well, so consider you have this example with the following labels, right? You have an example that's been labeled with three diamonds and one circle, so the aggregated label using a majority vote is a diamond. Uh, well, if you consider an additional label, if you add an, ad an additional diamond, or if you add an additional circle, then the aggregated label here doesn't change. And so impact sampling will say, OK, well, this example would have zero impact because no label you add to it would cause any change. Um, and so this is a problem. So can we do look ahead search? Uh, we could do look ahead search, uh, but that would be extremely expensive. Uh, so what we did is we came up with a form of what we called pseudo look ahead. And so what pseudo look ahead says is let R be the minimum number of labels to flip the aggregate label. So what that means is, OK, you have this example. R here would be three, because you need three additional circles to flip the diamond to a circle. And then we're going to redefine the impact of getting a circle to be the impact of getting three circles divided by three. And so what we're essentially doing is we're taking the future impact from labeling an example multiple times and normalizing it by how long it would take. So it's some sort of careful optimism here. All right, so uh, that's the algorithm. Now I want to show you a bunch of experiments where we try this algorithm. Um, we're going to use the same simulated data set from before. We're going to have two Gaussian clusters. We're going to have a budget of 1,000. Uh, we're going to simulate workers with 75% accuracy. And we're going to have 90 features in the data set. And here is the first graph. And the most important line in, the, in this graph is the topmost one. The topmost one is impact sampling. It's green. Uh, it beats everything else. The next important line in this gr graph is the bottommost line. That's passive learning. That's basically picking examples at random to label. That does the worst. Yes? I mean, time-wise, is it? I mean, are you just? 
Yes, every yes. Single You're thing in running the classifier. Okay. Right. So so you notice that impact sampling is extremely expensive. And so it takes a, a lot longer than something like random sampling. Um, and so this doesn't take that into consideration. Um, this is assuming that everything takes the same time, which it doesn't. Uh, that's one of the weaknesses of impact sampling. Yes? So <clears throat> I'm wondering uh, if I understand correctly, your, your model of label uncertainty doesn't take into account the model of the worker, uh, him or herself. In other words, you're, you're treating Every uh, worker the same. Right. Yes. And so what would happen if you added to that some pre-qualification exercise that would then give you effectively a prior on the label uncertainty as a function of the, of the worker? So that, right, so very simply, right, you take the worker, you check uh, his or her performance on 10 mm -hmm. even examples, mm -hmm. and you say, gosh, this worker is 90% accurate, this worker is 70% accurate. You feed that into the algorithm. Um, so the algorithm doesn't care about worker accuracy at all, but that's definitely an extension that would be extremely valuable, I think. Um, it, it could easily say, OK, well, here's the probability that I would get this label because this worker is this accurate, right? But it doesn't do that. Yes? I think that would change a lot of the work that you're talking about, though, right? Because it seems to me like the assumption that the errors are uncorrelated mm -hmm. is pretty key to a lot of the conclusions you've drawn. So if we had a notion of worker accuracy, then that would introduce correlation into the um, Right, so we, we assumed that there's no correlation between errors, and that's a strong assumption. Um, but I don't think it necessarily um, makes the results not valid. Um, well, like for, for the inductive bias example, right. like kind of what's going on is you're pooling over the errors, and that cancels them out. And so it yes, matter yes, not yes, related, yes. But if the errors are correlated, yes. that pooling won't. That's a great point. Um, Again, I, I would go back to what I said when I think Oren made a similar point, which is that all we're trying to do is look at patterns and simplify and look at patterns. Um, but you're absolutely right that if you have correlated errors, then the whole inductive bias thing would probably not hold as well, or it would change in some way. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the lines I didn't discuss in this graph are the ones in the middle which are uncertainty sampling and the variations that we came up with of, of that algorithm. OK, so that was a completely simulated data, data set. Now I want to look at Arrhythmia, which is a data set from the UCI Machine Learning Repository. We're still simulating workers here. Um, and we basically see the same sort of pattern. We see that impact sampling beats uncertainty sampling, which beats passive learning. And then finally, we have a relation extraction data set. This is a real data set that we actually crowdsourced from MTurk. Um, the results here are less strong than the previous ones, but they're still significant. Um, we see that impact sampling beats uncertainty sampling, which beats passive learning. Probably because this was the best one. <laughs> um, we did try on a num number of them, and several of them worked, several of them didn't. Um, and we do write this in the paper. We say, just like all active learning algorithms, um, our algorithm doesn't work on all data sets, but here are the ones that work. Uh, so that's reactive learning. And what we did is we defined reactive learning as a generalization of active learning. Uh, we showed why standard active learning algorithms fail. And then we came up with uh, new al algorithms for reactive learning that fixes the problems with standard active learning algorithms. And then we showed that impact sampling was interestingly a generalization of uncertainty sampling from reactive learning to active learning, or other way around, yes. So when you compare impact sampling against uncertainty sampling, uh, you point out there are scenarios where they do the same thing, and there are scenarios where they do different things. Yes. So why are you saying that impact sampling is a generalization of uncertainty sampling, and not vice versa? Because so impact sampling and uncertainty sampling do the same thing in certain settings when you're only doing active learning when relabeling is not necessary. So 
if you ignore reactive learning and you don't do any relabeling, they will do the same thing with perfect workers. But if you go to the setting where labels are noisy and you can relabel examples, um, impact sampling will do better than uncertainty sampling because uncertainty sampling will go into this infinite loop sort of behavior. And so you, because of that, you can consider impact sampling in some ways to be a generalization from active learning to reactive learning of uncertainty sampling. Yes. But uh, didn't you measure the impact by the number of clicks that it's wrong to collect? Uh, so we don't know that, right? We, we, can, make a, we can estimate it mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but I think there would be a lot of noise in that process. And this very clearly says this is the definite impact of what, what you have. Well, we didn't actually define impact sampling to say it's the number of flips from wrong to right. right. We just defined it as how much the classifier changes. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, you assume that this flip is making the wrong list. Yes, yes. Right. OK, so that was an in-depth look at the second part of my dissertation, uh, where we look at uh, the noise and size trade-offs in training sets. Um, but where did this data come from in the first place, right? Uh, so now I want to quickly talk about what I'm working on now, the final part of my dissertation, which addresses the very beginning of the machine learning pipeline, data acquisition. And specifically, we're going to look at how you can learn completely novel concepts. All right, so in all the work so far, we've made a critical assumption. And that assumption is that you're given some nice training corpus that you can label, right? But suppose right now, you wanted to train a classifier to identify all sentences that talk about climate change. How would you do it? Well, it would be really hard, right? Um, and you guys are doing a lot of this, I think. Uh, there are certain properties of, of this problem that make it hard. And, and uh, it's hard because, well, you don't have an existing good corpus to train on. You have no existing classifier. Uh, your concept is not in the knowledge base. And the class queue is horrible. So if you just randomly pick a sentence from the web, the chance that it's pro uh, positive for climate change is basically zero. right? So what do you do? Well, if you notice that the crowd can do more than label, which I'm sure you have, then you can expand your list of crowd primitives from just labeling to a lot of other things. right? So you can expand that list to, from labeling examples to asking the crowd to generate positive examples to generate negative examples, to generating trigger words, to generating trigger pairs. Um, and now we have a much more interesting decision problem here, right? So now the decision problem is, which of these actions do we take at any given time to train the best classifier starting from nothing? And in our preliminary work, we've just focused on two of these primitives to see where it might get us, uh, labeling examples and generating positives. Um, there are sort of lots of different ways that you could ask the crowd to generate positive examples, right? One of these ways is to just simply ask the crowd to use their brains and come up with sentences. Um, another way is to ask the crowd to, say, go to the web, um, find me sentences on the web and on news and copy and paste them. Uh, another way is to design a fancy search UI that allows the crowd to very quickly uh, go through your corpus to find relevant examples. Um, and we're just going to look at the second method. Uh, what we did is we asked the crowd to go on the web and on the news to copy and paste examples that are positive. And so uh, we tried three different strategies. Um, we tried a label-only strategy, which is we're going to ask the crowd to simply label randomly sampled examples. We tried a round-robin strategy. We're going to alternate between asking the crowd to generate positive examples and labeling examples that the classifier predicts as positive. And then we're going to try a seed strategy where we're only going to generate positives at the beginning, and then at some point stop generating positives and only ask the crowd to label uh, examples that we think are positive. So here's what happened when we tried to begin a classifier for death, so identifying examples of uh, death. Um, so as you can see, uh, the very bottom line, label only, as you might expect, doesn't do very well. 
but interestingly, it starts doing better than round robin at the very end. And so this is interesting because I think what this shows is that when you ask the crowd to generate positive examples, you're asking them to generate examples that are not from the distribution that you're actually testing on. And because you're not getting, because they're generating examples that are not from the distribution that you're testing on, eventually label only will do much better because you have many more examples uh, from that distribution. And so the seed strategy where we ask the crowd to only generate positive examples at the beginning to bootstrap uh, a classifier, and then after that only label, uh, that seems to do the best. All right, so that's the current state of learning completely novel concepts. Uh, I hope I gave you a good idea of what I've been working on in the last six years from <laughs> looking at uh, how you can intelligently acquire gold standard labels to how you can make the trade-offs between noise and diversity in a training set to how you can learn completely novel concepts. Um, I want to thank my advisors and mentors, without whom uh, this work would not have been possible. And I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>